Sabbath greetings. Has God been good to you? We want to thank you once again uh, for coming to worship the Lord. We praise the Lord for his grace and mercy. Uh, today is the, our final lesson in this series. Um, so uh, please feel free to participate. I'm going to acknowledge Elder McQueen. Um, I want him as well to play a prominent role. Elder McQueen, do you want to come to the front or you want to contribute from there? Feel free either way to come to the front or contribute from wherever you are over there. But thank you so much. So, um, so our final lesson, ablaze with God's glory. Ablaze with God's glory. Okay, ablaze with God's glory. So our memory text again, after these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Now, I'm just going to ask a question to Alder McQueen. If you just give us an introduction to this lesson. Alder McQueen? So, so we, we, we are looking at what happens just before Christ comes. What is the condition of God's church before Christ comes? very beginning of the quarter, we talk about God being victorious. So for 13 weeks, we've been waiting for that victory. And what we are talking about today is about God's glory. We see how Monday to Tuesday, it will be the believers getting ready for the celebration. On Wednesday, we see that the four angels and other will be celebrating. And the final day on Thursday, we see the crowning. We'll see the, the glory. Let me ask you a question. Do you see the light? Do you participate in that glory? Well, let's see how much we participate in that glory. Because today is the crowning. And after all the works by the angels and of the saints, today we have the heavenly host joining us in the celebration. Okay, that's, so that's quite important. So... On, on Sunday, thank you, Elder McQueen, and just stay nearby, preparation for the final crisis. So the Bible is very clear that we're living in the last days, and there is a final crisis which is going to take place before Christ comes. And this is the final crisis we've been studying throughout the quarter. So the final crisis will involve worship, as we said before. And worship, again, is going to be enforced, and it is very, very clear that we're at that point. But then how do we as a people prepare for that final crisis. Now, our first verse in, on Sunday is uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 to 6. And that verse says what? What is it telling us to do? Be what? No. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 to 6. It says we need to be what? To be vigilant, to be watchful, to be what? To be sober, Yeah. Because the day of the Lord shall come as a what? As a thief in the night. So therefore, we need to prepare. And what's very important to understand, as we know, is that time is short. And because time is short, we need to be watchful. Because again, if we're not watchful again, the devil will come upon us suddenly. So therefore, the Bible says that uh, here, the Apostle Paul urged the believers in Thessalonica to watch and be sober in the context of the second coming of Christ. So in the second coming of Christ, we have to be sober. We have to be watchful. So therefore, it's very, very important. Why? Because there's going to be a great deception. And the Bible says the deception will be so great, if it were possible, the very elect will be deceived. So therefore, how do we do that? We remain vigilant. So therefore, the Bible is very clear that the devil already knows that his time is short. So if he knows that his time is short, we should be able to understand that if time is short, 
is going to do everything that is possible to make sure he gets as many people as possible. So we need to prepare for the time of crisis. And again, we need to understand the time in which we live. People around the world understand that there is something going on in the world, that things are not as usual, you know, strange things are happening. So people are beginning to sense that the world cannot continue as it is. And that is why we as a people should not be surprised because we have been forewarned already. Yes. Anyone? Okay, somebody with the mic. Okay. Please feel free anytime to stop me and, and, and um, have some contribution. Now, when Christ was here, as you know, he wept over the city of Jerusalem. And he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you killed the prophets of God. And he says, a time is coming when they shall dig trenches around thee and they shall come and take you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Which means that Jerusalem was not able to understand the time in which you are living in. We must understand that we are living close to midnight. It's almost midnight. So therefore, events are wrapping up. So we need to understand what time we are living in because therefore we can then prepare for what is to come upon the world as a surprise. Yes, um, at the back there, somebody has a hand. And then Elder McKinney, if you just want to. It is true, we must be watchful, but we must also know what we are watching for. Yep. The traffic light is only good mm. if we know what's expected of us when we see each color. Mm. So we must know what are we watching for. Yeah, that's a good point. As we come to Elder McQueen, there are two types of people in the world. There are those that are, don't know they are prepared, okay? So, okay, three types of people actually. There are those who are prepared. So if you are prepared, you are ready. And then there are those who know they are not prepared. So if you know that you are not prepared, what do you do? You prepare. But there is a third group, those who don't know that they are unprepared. If you don't know that you are unprepared, therefore you are in the most miserable condition because you don't know that you are in danger. So I pray that we are either in the first group that is prepared or those that, don't, that know they are unprepared. Because if you know you are unprepared, then it is now that you begin to prepare, not tomorrow. My concern is not so much, you, you have three categories here? Yes. I'm not interested in the others. You mm. know what I'm interested in? Mm -hmm. The believers. Yes. You have to know the truth. Lower mm. down in the lesson, it says when you know the truth, mm -hmm. the truth will set you free. So we have to know, and above all, if we participate mm. in the proclamation of the third angel's message, we would have had the truth and there is safety. Amen. Very true. So it is a moment of just being prepared all the time. Um, a couple went away on a holiday. Uh, they were only going to go for three days. So they said to their teenage children, we're going on a holiday. We'll be back on Monday. It's Friday. We'll be back on Monday. So the children said, oh. Mommy and daddy are back on Monday. So obviously, Saturday, Sunday, party time. They brought all their friends, and the house was in a mess, and the parents came on Sunday. And when they opened the door, they could not recognize the house. The son comes down the stairs and says, Dad, we're supposed to come tomorrow. And he says, yeah, but be ye ready. So the whole point is that we have to be ready all the time. We don't become ready tomorrow. We become ready now. So again, it's knowing what time we're living in and be watchful. You remember when Gideon went with his men to, um, to, um, to fight the, um, um, the enemies of God? So I'm trying to... Um, yeah, Gideon. The Midianites, very good, okay. God said, to, you remember, he took 32,000 men. 32,000 men were sent. God says, there's too many. Those that are afraid, go home. Okay, and then there were 10,000 men. So obviously Gideon is thinking, goodness me, how am I going to fight the war? I'm fighting over thousands and thousands, and I've only got 10,000. And God says, there are too many for me. And then God says to Gideon, take those men to the water, let them drink. Out of those 10,000 men, uh, 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 9,700 men drank like dogs. They went into the water, and they began to drink and laugh like dogs. 
but 300 men. The Bible says they then took the water. And then as they were drinking, they were like this. And what were they doing? Watchful. Keeping an eye on the enemy. You are looking for people who are vigilant, people who are watchful. And God says, because of these people who are watchful, I will deliver Israel. So again, as God's people, the Bible says, we need to watch. For in such an hour, when you think not, the Son of Man will come. So again, it is, it's very important that we are people who watch. Now, uh, any, any questions, any comments? Yes. You know, we know the Bible says um, that the, uh, the devil is like a roaring lion yes. seeking whom he may devour. And we are told to be watch, watchful and be vigilant. Yes. And I think we, we are living in a time when our watching and our vigilance means what we watch on TV, mm -hmm. what we listen to on the radio, yes. the places we visit. Mm -hmm. All of this is part of that process. And immersing ourselves in the word of God, mm -hmm. in prayer, mm -hmm. in study, will build our watchfulness, yes. will build us in such a way that when we see something on TV that we're not supposed to see, yes. the Spirit of God will say to you, mm. switch it off. Yes. When we're listening to some of the music that's mm. playing today, the Spirit of God will say, don't listen to that. Mm. That's not for you. Mm. That's not building you up. So this is how we watch. Yes. We, we are engaged in the work of God. We are reaching people with the gospel. Yes. This is how we're watching. So when Jesus comes, he'll come us and find us doing the things that are pleasing in his sight. Amen. Because again, for our salvation is much nearer than when we first believed. Yeah, and sometimes people always say, Elder McKill says that I can hear the sound of the drum beat. You know, uh, even back then in times when people used to watch for trains that were coming, because we know that sound travels faster in a solid than in the air. Before a train was coming, you know, the people would say, train coming. Why? Because they could hear the vibrations way before the train came. And they could actually understand how far the train is. So again, if we as a people are listening carefully, if we listen carefully, we will hear the footsteps of an approaching God. So we are already prepared. And that's why Paul says, you are not going to be caught with surprise because you are not in darkness. Why? Because you've been listening and watching over the signs. Yes, Lorraine. Um, and um, we're living in a time when there is just so much to distract us. And I really believe that as, as Christians, we have to be very intentional yes. about what we watch, mm -hmm. what we listen to, mm -hmm. the places we go, the conversations that we engage in, because we can easily become desensitized mm -hmm. to the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Yes, Mr. Clean. According to, the, according to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1, he said, But of that time and the season, Broderick, he have need that I, I, I will, I said unto you, mm. for, for yourself, know it, Broderick, that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Mm. But the, the Bible says in Thessalonians, it tells us that it, the Lord shall descend from heaven with a great shout mm. and with the voice of the archangel and with trump of God mm. and then the, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Mm. But I think here that he will only come as a thief in the night for who wasn't prepared for him. That's very true and that's very clear. So we understand that Christ will come as a thief in the night to those who are what? Unprepared because a thief does not announce when he's coming. Mm. He's there already. Such a good point. Um, and just on, on Sundays or just a bit, it talks about Daniel chapter 2. What did you understand for, on Daniel chapter 2? What is the lesson saying in Daniel chapter 2? Where are we in the scheme of time? In Daniel chapter 2. If somebody was to ask you, do you know that Daniel chapter 2 has converted many, many people into the faith? Even many Muslims have become Christians by reading Daniel chapter 2. Why is Daniel chapter 2 so important? Yes, Colin. Yes. Okay. I think it's a Walmart to tell us what's happening in the different stages of life. Okay. And it would appear that we're in the point of iron and of clay now. Yeah. That's probably. Yep. Yeah, that's true. Yes, yes. Yes, Sister Audrey. Yeah. So 
I think it's very important because yes. it stands as encouragement for us that Christ is really coming back. Yes. Because all the kingdoms before, yes. they have passed away and we know which one is ruling now. Yes. And we know that the only thing left is for that stone to come. Amen. That stone to come and yes. fill the place up. And that's what represents the second coming of Christ. Yeah. So it encourages me because if all the other things happen, yeah. this one is certainly going to happen. Amen. Because if Babylon came... And it can be proved historically because Babylon is in Iraq. If Middle Persia came, and Middle Persia is in Iran. And if Greece came, okay, and Rome came, you can take a flight, you can go to Italy. All those kingdoms came in a sequence predicted by God way before those empires were there. So if all those things happen, and then the Bible says the fourth kingdom, which is Rome, will be divided into the ten toes, which are the ten regions of Europe, the ten nations of Europe. So we now understand that time has gone. So even when Christ came to this earth, it was the kingdom of Rome that was ruling. So when Christ was here, the nations had already gone. So what is now left is what? The Bible says in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven establish a kingdom which shall never pass away. So we are living in the toes. After the toes, Christ comes. So automatically we know and understand we are living just before, seconds before midnight. Yes, Sister. Yeah, just, just a previous question yes. that you asked. Um, Daniel, Daniel 2 and Revelation, yes. they're referred to as the ap apocalyptic books. Yes. Because they, they forecast the final destruction of the world. Yes. So they, they are the apocalyptic books. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Daniel and Revelation are probably, yeah, very important books. Brother and sister, husband and wife. Yes, El, yes somebody else? Elder McQueen, do you want to say something? Yes. I still think that we are struggling. Why do I say that? Because look, according to prophecy, if we study the prophecy, we will learn that we are the angels mm. to give the message. So if we give the message, we will know the message. Mm. And when we know that message, we won't be in darkness. That's why he said we should be alert. Mm. We should be awake. But I am saying to us here, are we in doubt? Mm. Because we are the angels who are going to fly in the midst of heaven mm. to give the everlasting gospel. Mm. So to give it, you have to know it. Yes. And to know it, you have to be it. Mm. So when we know it and we are it, there'll be no doubt. So I am saying, I'm looking forward to that celebration. Mm. Are you? And, and, and we'll come to that on Wednesday, what Elder McQueen is talking about. Let's just go to Tuesday or Monday, knowing the truth. It is the truth that will set you free. There is one truth. There are no multiple truths. Okay, so it's very important that we understand the truth. And the question that we have today is the question that Pilate asked Jesus Christ. When Pilate said to Jesus Christ, what is the truth? And it's very interesting, the truth was standing in front of Pilate, and Pilate could not see it. What is the truth? Are there many paths up to the mountain, mountain top? Are there many religions? Are there several truths? What is the truth? The Bible is very clear that there is only one truth, not two, not three. And we need to be sure as a people what we believe. Now the question is, it says here, God's final appeal to his people is to flee from the errors of Babylon and walk in the light of the truth. So Babylon has brought errors and the world has been made drunk. And the Bible is saying that we need to understand what the truth is. And again, the Bible talks about the deception that has come through the papacy and again through what is called Babylon, which is a union of church and state and all the other fallen religions. So we've got to be very clear. And again, the lesson is saying on, my, on Monday here as well that you've got to keep the main thing the main thing. Do not be distracted. Time is gone for you to be distracted. You need to know exactly what is to happen. 
The Bible is clear in chapter 13 of Revelation, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, chapter 17, chapter 18, that the enemy of God is papal Rome. The Bible is very clear. So do not be distracted. Some people are looking at China. Some people are looking at Islam. No, do not be distracted. Keep the main thing, the main thing, because the Bible is very, very clear. So we know that the deception in the last days, the shaking, will be caused by several things. And one of the things is that there will be false theories and heresies. So we need to read God's word. You need to be secure. Because, again, the deception will be so sharp that if we do not understand, we'll be deceived. And you've always said that you need to know the Bible well enough to know when Pastor Mario misquotes it. That's how. You do not get your feeding from the church. You do not get your feeding from the sermon. You feed for yourself during the week. Sabbath is the time to get top up. You don't get your theology by just coming to church. You need to read. You need to set the shaft mining. You go deeper. Find the rock, and then you'll be stabilized. Why is it that our young boys, they, when they go to prison, they are, you know, they, 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 they easily turn to Islam? Christian boys, many of them. Just last week, I was speaking just on uh, outside. He's speaking to a, a, young Muslim, a young Muslim chap. Again, he's saying that, yes, many Christian boys, when they come to prison, they change. They become Muslims. Why? It is because they are not grounded. Because if they are grounded, they will not move. So it is very important that we become what? Grounded. And even today, we've got many, Islam has come with these theories. Now we've got this new issue called Black Israelite Movement. That we have to, that God is only going to save black people. That God is only going to save black people. God is going to destroy everybody else. God only loves one group of people. And many of our black boys and men are going to this new movement. Keep the main thing, the main thing. Time is gone for you to be deceived. Do not die as a fool. You remember when Abda was, um, was killed by, um, uh, by, by Joab? You remember, yeah? Because he, he, you remember that the nation was split into two. You know, the Saul's family and David's family were fighting. And now there was a time when they were to bring them together. Almost when the nation was coming together, Joab goes to Abner. And he says to Abner, I need to have a word with you. I need to speak to you. And as Abner came out, Joab took out a sword and split him in, in, in half, you know, and then he died. And David says, Abner died as a fool. Mm. Were your hands tied, Abner, that you die as a fool? We cannot at this time die as fools. Time is gone for you to be distracted by every false heresy. Time is gone. So again, you need to know what you believe in and be settled in the truth that you cannot be moved. Yes. Yes, Brother Oren. Yes. Thank you. Just to mention on a point that was made earlier, the Muslims understand better than the Christians mm. the importance of prison ministry. Mm. They have a very vibrant prison ministry. And uh, Christians tend to shy away from prison. That's one thing. The other thing, too, is that in the book of Revelation, the text there repeats itself. He that has an ear, let him hear, let him hear yeah. what the Spirit said unto the churches. Mm -hmm. That has been repeated several times. Mm -hmm. And uh, the repetition of that in the Revelation echoes what Jesus said in Matthew. He that has ears to hear, let, let him hear. Let him hear. Yeah. Because we come to church and we listen, but do we understand what hearing means? Mm -hmm. Hearing means following through on what you have listened to and what you have learned. And in our homes, we, we will ask our children to do certain things and the child don't move. Mm -hmm. And you say to the child, did you hear me? Mm -hmm. Meaning that hearing, we expect actions to be followed. It's yes. the same thing with God. That's true. So therefore, blessed is he that hears the yeah. words of the book and doeth them. Yeah. We are supposed to hear and follow him. Amen. Thank you. 
thank you so much. Okay, Tuesday, the Reformation. Anyone wants to say something on the Reformation you've read on Tuesday? What was the Reformation all about? Do we know? The Reformation, what was it all about? He says the Reformation continues. What was it all about? Yes, Brother Cain, the Reformation. So we know that the Reformation, it says that God raised up the last day people to stand on the shoulders of the great reformers of the past, with the Bible as their only creed. Christ alone is their only source of salvation. The Holy Spirit is their only source of strength and the return of the Lord as a consummation of their hopes. The Reformation took place uh, you know, um, when people began to discover the truths of the Bible. That is the Reformation. So we are here much later on after the Reformation has gone, but we are finishing the work that the Reformers have started. Come start with John Wycliffe, John Haas. You know, we talk about Luther, we talk about Zwingli, we talk about Calvin. All these were Reformers, and these Reformers broke away from the Church of Rome. That's why they're called Protestants. Why? Because they were protesting against the errors of Rome. And one of the themes of the Reformation was sola, what? Scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. But the Church of Rome was saying the Bible and tradition. So again, this is what caused the Reformation. Now the work of Reformation is not finished. It is not finished. There is still a work to be done just before the close of probation. And that is why God has raised up this movement to be able to finish the work that was started. And again, we've said it before, we need to understand who we are. We are not just another church. We are not just another church. And again, time is far gone for you to question your identity. If you do not know who you are, if you do not understand why God raised this church, that this church has been raised up for such a time as this, then I don't know how much time you have. Okay, if you do not know who you are at this time, at this time, the Pentecostals know who they are. The Mormons know who they are. Islam says there is no God but Allah. Islam is firm on what they believe. How can it be that God's people don't know who they are? We tell you, you know, we, we, the Bible says the remnant, oh, we're not so sure, oh, no, uh, you know, we begin to question, how can you not know who you are at such a time as this? So therefore, God has raised up a group of people in the last days, has given us a message to give, and that message has been given to us, to give to other people who are in Babylon, because they are God's people, and they have to be called out of Babylon. Yes, Alan McQueen or anybody else? Yes. The truth was given to us yes. at Seventh-day Adventist. Yep. And the reason why they wanted was to destroy Bible. It was to remove the truth away from mankind. But however, we were, we were, such, a, we were, we were such a lucky people that good people used to read the Bible and believe in God's word. And when they were destroying Bible, good people tried to get copies of Bible. Yes. And because of good people who tried to hide away copies of, copies of Bible, that's the reason why we were able to find the truth. Yes. The, whole, the whole reason why the Pope tried to remove Bible is to remove the truth away from mankind. But thanks be to God that we have got the truth. And we must try yes. to live the truth. Yes. Because these lessons are very powerful lessons. Yes. And if we don't believe in ourselves studying these lessons, well, I don't know what else to Exactly. Say. Why, why spend your time in a church, in a movement that you don't have any faith in? 
no one dies for a religion in which they don't believe in. The apostles, they, you know, it was accused that maybe the apostles uh, stole the body of Christ and they were saying that Christ had resurrected, but he had not resurrected. If the apostles were lying, why would they die for a lie? No one dies for a religion that they don't believe in. So again, we, we got to understand who we are. So again, God has raised us up as a movement. We are more Methodist than Methodists. We are more Baptist than Baptists. We are more Pentecostal than Pentecostals. Again, God has given us this message. So God has his own people in these other churches, people who are worshiping God based upon the light that they have. Because in the time of ignorance, God winks at it. So God has people who are faithful, but he needs to what? Call them out. And that is why God has raised this movement to call them out out of what? Babylon. Why? Because the angel in chapter 18, verse 1, Elder McQueen talked about it. The fourth angel says, Babylon is fallen and is fallen and has become what? The habitation of demons and devils. Okay, and it says the sins of iniquity have reached up to heaven, meaning that Babylon cannot be reformed. Babylon cannot be changed. Babylon has to be destroyed. This is what the Bible says. When Noah, when Noah preached to the antediluvians, the point was, the final appeal was, come in the boat and live. Stay outside and die. That was the only option. But the appeal was made because why? The antediluvians could not be reformed. When, when Lot was in Sodom, again, the appeal was escape for thy life, run to the mountains. Why? Because Sodom and Gomorrah could not be reformed. Sodom and Gomorrah had to be destroyed. Same thing with Babylon. Babylon cannot be reformed. It has to be destroyed. This is what the Bible says. If you become upset, you become upset with God. But God is saying Roman Catholicism cannot be reformed. It has to be destroyed. And it is destroyed by the preaching of the three angels' messages. Yes, somebody. And again, these things are not new. These things were spoken way before we were born. The reformers said exactly what you were saying. So this is not new. This is not hate speech. This is the truth. Faithful are the wounds of a friend than the kisses of an enemy. Okay, any, any, any points, Elder? Okay, good. Okay, let's, um, um, so, so uh, let's just go to, um, okay, so, so um, the work is not finished, so we have to finish the work, and again, again, the truth about the Sabbath, the truth about the sanctuary, the truth about the second coming, the truth about salvation, all these truths need to be given out to the world. And this is why it's talking about the fourth angel who accompanies the third angel. And the earth is lightened with the glory of God, which is, we come to Wednesday, the glory on the earth. Yes, any questions? Yes, Mark. Yes. And, and again, on Wednesday, he talks about the glory fruits the earth. And he says at the beginning that the great controversy between good and evil in the universe is also about God's honor and reputation. Satan, a rebel angel, has declared that God is unjust. He demands worship but gives little in return. As you know, the rebellion in heaven, the book talks about in the book of Isaiah, God sits on the throne. 
who is his creator. God is God alone. But Satan, a creature, says what? I will sit also on the mount of the congregation. So Satan comes to God and says, God, it's now my turn. You sit on the throne. I, too, want to sit on the throne. So this is where the controversy was. And it began concerning the character of God. God asked me to humble myself. Since when has God humbled himself? The angels listen. Yeah. Since when has God humbled himself? I have a plan. And God says, no, you cannot have it that way. Since when has God's plan not been taken place? Tell me one plan of God that hasn't taken place. The angels listen. Yeah. God has his plan. All his plans always take place. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I have my way. But God says, no, you cannot have your way. You tell me, angels, when have I ever had my own way? God always wants to have his own way. The angels listen. Yeah. God always has his own way. And then the controversy builds up to accusations. God is selfish. God is not loving. God wants worship by himself. God is using us. We need to break free. And Satan was able to manipulate this from himself onto God. So that now in heaven, it was not Satan on trial. It was now who? God on trial. And that's why a third of the angels believed it. So God was on trial. So therefore, the great controversy is concerning the character of God. Is God just? Is he loving? Does he always have his own way? What is the issue? All throughout, God did not have an answer. But when Christ came, the plan of salvation, God had an answer. Because when Christ came and Christ died, God had an answer. God did not want this to happen. We are told that when God allowed Christ to die, it was so painful to him. So God not only had his own way, but again, he also suffered as well when Christ came to die. So again, at the cross, Satan's mask was, re was revealed and Satan was seen for who he is, the one who would kill very God himself. So therefore, the glory of God is about the glory of God seen amongst his people who would defend the character of God. God is being blamed for things he has nothing to do with. But therefore, we as a people with our lives are supposed to defend the character of God. Any questions on that? The 144,000 have their father's name. And name has to do with what? Character. So therefore, we defend God's character. Any, any questions on, on, on Wednesday? Are we about to wrap up? is the way my mind works because I'm looking for a celebration. On that Tuesday, we learned that the movement give glory to God. Okay? Those of us who belong to that movement, but on the Wednesday, look at the unity. It says, first of all, the beasts. Second, the 24 elders. Third, 10,000 angels, and then all the people. I don't want to even entertain the controversy that we like to engage in. Because here, I'm just looking for the glory of God to be seen. And I want to be part of it. So, because I'm thinking of the celebration, I can't think otherwise, where I see so many different groups engage in the glory of God. And I'm saying that's where we ought to be and it's time that we stop. You know, a lot of, we have controversy among ourselves. We have to unite. If the angels unite and the beasts unite and the elders unite, why are we divided? I mean, the celebration moves. Thank you so much. Yeah, and, and we are told that um, when the character of Christ is reproduced in his people, Christ will come to claim them as his own. So God is waiting until his people produce such a character that will reflect him, then he will come for his people. 
And the question is that who determines the harvest? Is it the wheat that is ready or is it the farmer? Who determines the harvest? How does the farmer know when to harvest? Does he just go and harvest any time or he waits? He waits, but at the same time he's seeing whether the wheat has come to the point of harvest. So again, it's both a working in the wheat itself and from the farmer himself. And again, we will be talking about this character. It says here on, on, on Wednesday before we go to Thursday. There is no glory for ourselves in our good works or our righteousness or our goodness. The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other. This is the glory which comes from the work of the third angel. So we do not have glory for ourselves. We are just instruments in the hands of God. And that is very, very important to keep us humble. Okay, we've got to be very careful when we praise people. We've got to be very careful when we honor people. We have to be very, very clear. At one point, I'll say this, and I'm sorry for using this example, but I have to use it. Um, when Mario Balotelli uh, scored Italy's second goal against Germany in the European Championship final, when he was asked about the goal that he scored, he says, when I score, I don't celebrate because it is my job. He says, does the postman celebrate when he delivers the post? No, it is his job. The Bible is very clear. When you have done everything that God has asked you to do, you must say we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which is what required of us to do. And this is the nature of God's people who will reveal his character. At one time, John Wesley said, uh, uh, John Wesley, he says, Give me a hundred preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. I care not whether they be clergymen or laymen. Such alone will shake the gates of hell and set the kingdom of God on earth. A hundred men, whether they be preachers or laymen, who care nothing about the glory, but the glory of God. So again, the people who will give the final warning are people who will give themselves to God. They do not get the glory because all glory goes to God. Let's go to Thursday. Um, the slain lamb. The slain lamb. Any, 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 any comments on that? The slain lamb. This is important on, on, the, on the issue of the slain lamb because, again, we are talking about the theme of the Bible. Because we know from Genesis to Revelation, it talks about who? Christ. Christ is the man revealed in the Bible, cover to cover. And what Angel Rodriguez um, um, says here, uh, he says, we must intentionally place the lamb that was slain at the center of our doctrines. If our doctrines are not based upon Christ the lamb, they are nothing. So all our doctrines must be based upon the lamb that was slain. And then he says here, um, and the mission and the heart of every sermon we preach, every article we write, every prayer we make, every song we sing, every Bible study we give, in everything that we do, Christ has to be yeah. the center. Yeah. It is the lamb that was slain. And when the redeemed are before Christ, they will be singing, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain. So again, Christ has to be the center. So in the book of Daniel and Revelation, as we discovered, there are many beasts, creatures, the ten horns, the woman riding the beast, all these different creatures. But in the midst of all these creatures, there is a lamb slain. that was slain. And because the lamb was slain, you and I can have hope today. May the Lord bless us as we continue to worship him as we finish this lesson, uh, this quarter. But I, uh, again, I will say today, it is a privilege and an honor. I do not hold it lightly to be a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I have no doubt who we are. I do not question my identity, not at this particular time. You need to know who you are. And if you do not know who you are, then what's the point of coming to a church which you have doubts in? May the Lord bless us to be faithful to the end. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Elder McQueen.